Good afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm O.P. Yadav, Editor-in-Chief of Indian Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery, and we're reporting from the sidelines of the 65th Annual Conference of the Indian Association of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgeons jointly with the Asian Society of Cardiovascular Surgery being held in Chennai, India. We are privileged to play host to Dr. Carlos Mestres. Welcome, Carlos. Good afternoon. Okay. Dr. Mestres is senior consultant at the University Hospital in University of Zurich. Carlos, you had a brilliant presentation on mitral annular calcification, and that's what I want to discuss with you for my read, for my viewers. Mm -hmm. Now, is it a disease entity in its own self, or is it just a bystander? I would say, uh, I think it's a controversy on that because the entity as such, we name mitral annular calcification, has been out there for decades. What happens today is because we get more patients, and I'm talking about the Western world, uh, uh, elderly patients, they come for procedures, there are mod studies, and then we, let's say, discover more cases because we study more patients. This entity probably, probably is not the same like uh, the calcification of the mitral valve we see in uh, rheumatic heart disease, which is endemic in this part of the world. So probably they are a, a not exactly the same uh, type of uh, disease, although it's, it's, it's there for, for, for a long time. There is a um, uh, kind of uh, evolution. Some experts say that uh, it's linked to caseous uh, mitral uh, kind of obsessification of the mitral valve that is uh, also recognized in, in recent times. Okay. So is it related to uh, other pathologies like atherosclerosis and metabolic abnormalities? It's difficult to say. Actually, when you look into the literature and you dig a bit better on, on the problem, uh, to me, the uh, most comprehensive study uh, published so far was done by Dr. Ariela Pomeranz in England uh, in the 70s. And then actually she was studying people with uh, degeneration of the mitral valve and the mitral valve annulus. And then uh, she found that the incidence of mitral annular calcification grows exponentially beyond the age of 70. And when it reaches 70 to 75, there is also uh, the two curves in terms of uh, sex. They are different. So there's uh, much more predominant in uh, female individuals than in uh, male individuals. So uh, probably there is something to do with a degenerative process. And it's, uh, to me, uh, with my limited knowledge, it's difficult to establish if it is related to a given specific infection or not. Uh, you know that for years there was some uh, hypothesis that, for instance, atherosclerosis could be related, uh, for instance, to chlamydia infection, something like that. I, I personally uh, uh, have no really um, good input about that in the specific uh, field of uh, calcification of the mitral annulus in elderly people. And how do we, how frequently do we encounter this in our clinical practice, the surgical practice? Well, I think this is also difficult to say because we do not have uh, at the moment uh, large uh, epidemiological studies on that. However, considering the pattern of diseases that we see, especially in the Western world, where a proportion of patients, significant proportion of patients come for procedures beyond the age of 65, 70, and 75, which is uh, particularly uh, the case of uh, uh, aortic valve stenosis. Then we see uh, a number of patients with aortic valve stenosis and mitral anodic calcification as part of the complex. If it is exactly the same uh, kind of entity or not, uh, I'm not sure if it is completely established. And is it benign or does it have sinister clinical implications? Well, benign is a concept that we need to, dis, uh, to define. It's like if okay. a tumor is benign or malignant, uh, probably from uh, the calcification point of view, um, it's not going to be malignant. However, when it comes to clinical practice in which we need or it's recommended that a patient gets a given procedure like aortic stenosis 
or uh, mitral regurgitation or stuff like that, then may become a real problem from the surgical point of view because this really entails uh, uh, tremendous uh, technical difficulties. And I'm sure that everybody in the audience with uh, some degree of seniority, they have faced uh, this serious problem uh, intraoperatively when you do, for instance, uh, mitral valve surgery, or when you do surgery for the small aortic root and you need to enlarge the root in the presence of a calcified aortic uh, mitral anomalous, which is, of course, something to me challenging even today. So that's technically, but does it have any connotation in terms of, is it associated or correlated with coronary artery disease or arrhythmias? Uh, not, not really. Uh, the original studies were very interesting back in the 70s because uh, at that time it was found that this entity, as I say from the studies from Ariella Pomerantz, uh, were found to be identified in elderly people with some degree of mitral regurgitation. And at that time, uh, in, were some development in, uh, uh, in uh, heart valve surgery, it was thought that because of these patients, they were having mitral valve regurgitation, they could be candidates for eventual mitral valve surgery. But at that time in the 70s was not much experience. What we know now is that uh, many of these patients, they may have uh, different degrees of mitral regurgitation. Another thing is we need to indicate the procedure or not. But what is true is that if something uh, needs to be done, that represents a technical challenge. That's for sure. We know that these patients, they may eventually have higher de degrees of morbidity and mortality uh, when they uh, face a, a surgical procedure. So what's the best imaging modality to look at? I think imaging today is, uh, is a fundamental tool uh, for physicians and for surgeons. And then we have learned so much about that. Uh, imaging includes, for instance, from uh, echocardiography that has been uh, the travel companion of the surgeons in the past uh, 35 years. Uh, and now we have uh, CT scans CT. and MRI. I think the, the uh, recent uh, introduction of uh, modern software in a CT, I think it's a fundamental tool to assess the extension of the mitral anular calcification. I think, uh, uh, which is uh, to say something when you uh, send a patient for a transcatheter valve uh, procedure, uh, today uh, the combination of echo and uh, CT and even MRI uh, can uh, give you some input on this uh, fusion kind of imaging in which you use uh, some techniques. I think CT, uh, of course, uh, with ECHO is a fundamental tool to assess the mitral uh, complex in these patients. And once you are operating on these patients, say for mitral pathology, how does it change your operating strategy and how do you handle this? Cancification. This is uh, a, a, a real uh, challenge, I feel, for the surgeons. When you have a look at the experiences reported so far, and I, again, believe that most of us, they have had patients like uh, those, uh, there is no clear uh, kind of uh, input as to what we need to do. For instance, uh, an option that has been popularized out there uh, by our colleagues from the Cleveland Clinic uh, was to decalcify it, to look for uh, uh, patching the posterior annulus uh, after resection of the entire uh, calcium uh, kind of uh, stone, because at the end it's a stone, and in many patients they have this kind of horseshoe uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, of shape. Uh, but uh, this is an option. Uh, some people, they will do uh, also supraannular implantations of uh, prosthesis if you need a prosthesis uh, following uh, the old kind of uh, principle of the ROS2 operation or looking for any area within the left atrium to anchor a prosthesis there. So there are probably two or three surgical options, including uh, decalcification of the annulus, uh, patching and buff implantation, uh, supraannular implantation as well. But uh, at the end, uh, sometimes uh, this is not enough that uh, we can face uh, really uh, difficult situations like uh, um, rupture of the atriventricular group. That's something that has been described. So I don't think that at the moment uh, uh, there is uh, experience enough to recommend this option uh, or this option or this option. So I think the experience and the skills of the surgeon, many times they are also important at the time of deciding what to do in the operating room. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, we just heard Dr. Mistress. He feels mitolanular calcification is a standalone entity, a disease process in itself. It increases with age, it has clinical implications, and it does change your intraoperative strategy, and a lot really needs to be still defined. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Well, just uh, before closing, uh, uh, some other possibilities today because of the advent of uh, transcatheter valves. Yeah. Then there are some reports about uh, open uh, left atrium direct implantation of transcatheter valves and also transeptal, transvenous or transapical implantation of uh, prosthesis. But the results, they are still uh, based on small cohorts of patients. Uh, they don't seem to be as good as for other transcatheter therapies. So I think we still need to learn uh, uh, a lot in this field. Maybe this calcification gives them a good annulus for placement of the percutaneous valves. Well, it's part of the deal. However, when you analyze some of the results they are now in press with uh, transcatheter therapies, uh, the mitral annular calcification in the mitral scenario, like for instance, belfin valve or belfin ring, is uh, showing up with the worst uh, results in terms of uh, uh, procedural success with uh, morbidity and mortality as well. So I think we need to, to wait and see what's going to happen with these new techniques. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Enjoyed your discussion. Thank you. Thank Pleasure. you very much. Pleasure Thank being you. here.